thank you so much. It's uh, it's for me. It's a great pleasure to be invited today here. And as you already heard, I am currently in uh, in India uh, at Manipal University. So there, I am um, um, invited as an international faculty for the School of Nursing. <clears throat> so uh, let me just uh, say a few words about telemedicine in Ukrainian conflict. Maybe it would be more than a few words, of course, but uh, and if something that you would like to hear was not mentioned today, of course, I'm more than uh, happy to provide some extra information on that. So here's the, this is where Ukraine is, and uh, this is India in green. So for those who are not familiar with, uh, with Ukraine or where it is located, this is the geographical representation. It's quite far away. <clears throat> and um, as you can see, it's a rather large country in Europe. So this information was taken from the India Times, and that shows um, the, the first attacks um, in Ukraine, which were conducted over two years ago. It's almost two years ago since the war has started uh, in Ukraine. <clears throat> so from various directions, there were some uh, attacks and still ongoing. And here, it's, uh, it's the news from today. As you can see, it's the 15th February, 2024. So it's uh, today as we speak. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a huge attack uh, in the morning. So um, as you can see, the war is still ongoing and the conflict is still ongoing. And the need for support for, uh, in terms of healthcare is still a huge issue. This is me some time ago, I think about a year ago when I was visiting my parents there. And this is the bridge where my parents had to be evacuated. So it's still not everything is, of course, looks like that. Some places have been rebuilt, but of course, the infrastructure is not functioning um, on its best yet. So as uh, has been already mentioned, uh, I am working at Health Tech Without Dollars as uh, it's an NGO and uh, we do have several purposes. And one of those purposes is that we would like to, to really support people to provide rapid um, access to any needed healthcare uh, in terms of crisis. Of course, we cannot provide it in terms of physical assistance because it's quite it's quite difficult. That's why the telemedicine is a crucial aspect. So another thing we are also would like to call ourselves as innovation hub of ecosystem and ecosystem builder. So uh, of course there is a huge gap um, in healthcare industry when it comes to the war. And there the technology comes um, into the play. So in this case, we're really trying to facilitate those collaborative aspects. We try to work together with other uh, organizations who are also able to provide um, any kind of support for people. So uh, yes, we're driven by innovation. And yes, we have uh, lots of meaningful uh, partnerships. We're working on that um, since two years. And uh, we do have opportunities to create even more um, meaningful communication and opportunities for um, to deliver healthcare access to um, to any kind of population during humanitarian crisis, and of course uh, the humanitarian crisis can be very different. It can be uh, caused by the humankind or by the nature, and still um, it's there with us. And uh, we do not think uh, there would be ever the time when there would be no crisis, as we know. So telehealth in Ukrainian conflicts, uh, and again, going back to the Health Tech Without Borders perspective, we do have some, uh, we have built some essential experiences. So um, I would go back to that, to those experience in a minute, but now I just want to say that uh, we have um, really shown the, um, the prompt response to humanitarian crisis uh, in Ukraine. And um, we have, built uh, or helped to build the state of our delivery system, um, which um, really was useful uh, when the infrastructure was destroyed, especially healthcare infrastructure. So um, yes, we had to, uh, to work hard and we had to reach out to the professional leaders 
um, in order to coordinate uh, any kind of volunteers, uh, any kind of support. So we were able to provide clinical and technical support. And of course, uh, lots of our colleagues at Health Tech Without Borders are not from Ukraine. And um, there was, of course, some other aspects which, which needed to be addressed in order to, to provide really great support, which was needed, which was uh, valued, and which was really up to date. So Ukraine Telehealth Relief was the very first uh, initiative conducted by uh, Health Tech Without Borders as NGO. And uh, there were two goals for that. We will wanted to help the Ukrainian healthcare system to cope with difficulties uh, when there was no medical care available. And we wanted to provide it as urgent as possible and obviously free of charge. And the second one is the high quality psychological support. Of course, the war is, uh, is a, a very hard and heavy experience for, for any person. And of course, if you're in the middle of the crisis, if you're in the middle of the, of the war, um, there's a lot of psychological support that might be required. This is the timeline. Um, how the Ukraine telehealth relief was conducted. As you can see, there were several phases to that. So the phase one was call to action. So the war has started on 24th of February. And as you can see, two days after the start of the war, there was call to action. So this call to action continued to until 11 of May. So this first phase was uh, very intense. Um, so after the call of to action was announced uh, in first stage, about 240 um, clinicians applied to be a volunteer. Then um, there was, of course, a selection of the clinicians because lots of things had to be verified, their credentialing um, components, the registration whatsoever. And on the other hand, we have been um, also working to, to understand who are the telehealth providers uh, on the other side. So we can link those clinicians to those uh, uh, platforms. So at that stage, also some pilot testing has been conducted. Um, and then, of course, there was uh, simultaneously some collaborative meetings with the uh, Ministry of Health of Ukraine. And then uh, we have been working together to, to have um, to go live, to help to go live um, for those uh, systems for telehealth uh, platforms, which were already available. And um, so this uh, first phase call to action, as you can see, it was uh, until 11th of May. And it also covers um, fully the second phase where we were working on the preparation. So, and the preparation was also quite diverse, of course, because uh, there were many solutions available and uh, not all of them were able to, to suit our purposes. So also, as you can see, there were many more clinicians, many more volunteers who wanted to help, who wanted to participate. And uh, we have been working quite uh, hard in order to um, achieve the goals which were set by the, by the conditions, by the environment, but also just not to lose people who are willing to participate. So, of course, there were unique challenges, obviously. When there is a war, uh, you can't avoid um, thinking about many things, the barriers uh, to, to success. There was a huge time pressure. So in terms of when we talk about the telehealth solution, it must be deployed and it must be workable as quick as possible because otherwise, what's the purpose of telehealth? Of course, the location of deployment, it should be uh, implemented in various crisis zone settings. So for example, uh, in, in, in some areas, there is ongoing uh, military conflict. In some areas, there are only bombings or maybe some other devastation, but there is no active conflict anymore, but there is no infrastructure. 
So uh, it should be whatever um, telehealth solution you would like to deploy, it must be adopted to those various uh, crisis zone settings. And of course, the areas which I have been talking about. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the partnerships with the local agencies and organizations are required because without the local participation, it's quite difficult to deploy any kind of telehealth solutions. So the coordination and collaboration with other agencies, the healthcare officials, uh, also, of course, including the Ministry of Health, any other organizations such as uh, also newly um, established NGOs uh, were there. And then, of course, there is a compliance to local digital health law and licensure and credentialing, because once you uh, use the telehealth for the purposes of delivering healthcare, of course, you must have and must think of the professionals who are sitting on the other side. So they have to be, uh, they have to have current licensure, of course, it have to be um, uh, renewed. And of course, they should have some credentials credentials for um, for conducting any kind of consultation. So it's uh, it's quite difficult process and it required also uh, a lot of uh, work uh, because the NGO was new, obviously, uh, lots of things had to be done manually. So it's not like there is a system for that. So uh, and of course, in the beginning, as the war has just started, it was quite difficult to establish some kind of um, records, which is uh, which would be really useful, of course. So there are some other challenges as well. So, um, of course, if we would like to uh, provide or deliver telehealth in places uh, needed, and of course, um, to address the, the aspects, so the, the critical healthcare aspects which are needed, you have to uh, make sure that the local population uh, will adopt this telehealth solution. So um, regardless uh, whatsoever, Ukraine is quite a digital country. So a lot of people have been using uh, digital health, telehealth, telemedicine before. And still, you still have, uh, you still must have some strong partners, uh, some mm, known platforms, so some known telehealth solutions uh, which people do not have to learn from the beginning they were already there so it's uh, it just creates uh, trustworthiness and of course this is something that you would like to have of course that people would trust you and that's that the solution the healthcare related solution is really to trust because uh, the war is the challenge already you are missing your regular consultations with your physicians or with your specialist, and then you have to go to, I don't know, to log in into the app and try to, to receive the same kind of health care, which is quite challenging, of course. Then we have, of course, digital outreach. Everybody, all stakeholders must know about the telehealth platforms and services. Um, that would definitely um, ensure the the good outreach and the good coverage of the resources which are have been which have been provided so the community uh, also have to help us or support us with uh, making sure that those digital solutions those telehealth solutions are known and visible and there to trust and then of course the security and the safety uh, of course nobody would like to share any personal data you know that um, it's quite uh, now I'm in India and I have to share any kind of data and I'm, I, I just don't know those platforms. Uh, they are quite new for me. So for me, um, using this new application is just as challenging as for some people to use some kind of telehealth uh, solutions because you don't know this um, solution and still you have to provide quite sensitive information. So yes, it has to be safe for both for providers and as well for the patient, because also healthcare providers do not want to reveal any uh, extra data which is not relevant for uh, providing healthcare. So 
yes, we should have been provided for any kind of uh, problems, and but also for cyber attacks and power outages. So there are some, there's the damage could be everywhere. So um, of course, internet is very prone to that because obviously, if the router is not working, then you do not have any internet and people in the areas where there were severe bombings, they were fully relying on the mobile internet, which was also not always working. So it was it was a huge uh, problem and still is, of course, because the bombings are still ongoing. So it's still there. Um, there is other things such as cultural sensitivity. So uh, if you think to deploy any kind of telehealth solution, it should be culturally sensitive. So you cannot just take something from somewhere and then just uh, translate it and then it's going to, uh, you know, be ready to use. It's not only language, it's also the contextual uh, component, which is crucial in deploying of any kind of telehealth solutions. So and then we have, of course, digital and just health literacy. It's quite difficult to address it during the war time. Uh, we must have been uh, working on um, on health literacy and digital health literacy before the war. But during the war, there is never a good sign for that. So you must ensure that all the solutions you present are crystal clear, easy to understand on any level uh, without uh, creating extra misunderstanding. Then we have the usability components. Yes, it must be easy to use and it also has to work in any kind of situation. So for example, if you have the uh, telehealth solution which must um, have all the components such as text, audio, and video, it might not be working because in case if you have uh, internet problems, you would be happy to have only text solution, but audio and video would probably not work. So uh, the telehealth solution must be absolutely easy to use and do not provide extra um, burden on the any kind of system. And then we have, of course, the flexibility components um the needs are constantly changing in terms of conflict today is the one situation tomorrow is the absolutely different situation and the my problems are evolving the capabilities are evolving there is also scarcity of local healthcare workforce there is a scarcity of any other resources so you always must ensure that you monitor the current needs um, so that your telehealth solution is really um, tailored to the local context and to the, uh, the needs of the population in this current situation. When we're talking about the onboarding of clinical volunteers, uh, in our case, it was uh, very simple and very fast. So uh, everybody received detailed text and video instruction, how the telehealth working in different languages not all um, clinical volunteers who were engaged or who were connected through the telehealth platform were Ukrainian. So in some cases, the um, translation uh, component was switched on. However, it worked. It still worked. So um, it was definitely more difficult when we talk about the audio and video. But when we're talking about the chatting with the doctor, yes, it worked. And then, of course, there should be some 24-7 support service and technical support because you can understand and you can imagine that um, those services might, might sh shut down. There, may, there might be some other technical problems, some bugs or cyber attacks, which might which need to be um, resolved quite quickly. So um, there was the online training on how to work with patients uh, from the war zones because you can imagine that there was a lot of uh, mental health issues and fresh trauma. The trauma is still there, but in the beginning it was, of course, uh, very new, very fresh to everyone. And then there was also peer-to-peer -peer support for the psychologists who worked with the victims uh, of assault of war. So um, those kind of onboarding uh, aspects and procedures were there in place. There are some requirements. Some of them are high priority. 
some of them are medium priority requirements. Of course, they are all requirements. But for example, if we uh, talk about the ability to rapidly deploy a solution, the telehealth solution is absolutely high priority requirements. Also the compliance, uh, both from the United States of GDPR, from European Union must be there in place. Then we have the local language uh, localization. Well, for Ukraine in the beginning, Russian was uh, still possible to use because many people do understand it. So it made it a little bit easier, you know, to use at least both languages. It was uh, performed in one week, which is, which is really fast. Then um, simplified user interfaces. Uh, so when it comes to the application, the telehealth solution, the interface must be as simple as possible. So it must be really uncomplicated for uh, clinicians and for the patients as well. So uh, as I mentioned before, the several modalities such as text, audio or video based uh, visits or consultations must be there. So you must, it's better when you can choose what kind of modality you like to use because for example if you know that your internet connection is not stable you will definitely not opt for the video based consultation uh, the intake and visit summary forms of course they're important because once you see one clinician next time you might uh, opt for the uh, online consultation you there is a probability that you have a different clinician but your records would be there too so uh, it's, it's it's absolutely high priority requirement then the scalability. So uh, in some cases, of course, well, in our case, it was absolutely the, the true. There was, there should be some opportunity to increase the capacity. So to increase the capacity for both clinicians and the patients who are opting for this kind of consultation. And the cybersecurity, for example, by using VPN, and device agnostics, because, uh, well, many people lost their devices. Some of the devices, are either Android driven, some of them are iOS driven. So um, whatever telehealth solution you would like to deploy, it must work on any uh, device. There are some medium priority requirements, such as where do you, uh, uh, where do you save the data, uh, such as electronic scheduling with the reminder system is definitely nice to have, but maybe not absolutely the priority interoperability and user identification. So the mobile application is always uh, nice to have, but in some cases it's not required if you have the tablets or if you have the laptop, well, you, you never know what kind of uh, application you would get. Of course, on the phone is the easiest way. Um, simultaneously visit for a single provider, the dashboard analytics, the images uploads, or if you would like to have, for example, you have the report from the doctor, from, I don't know, from the physical consultation, you still like to consult the doctor from the telehealth platform, you can still be able to upload something for the consultation. It's also very nice to have, but maybe not to the highest priority. Um, the local presence and uh, the existing network of patients in Ukraine is of course the very good to have, because if you have the existing network of patients in Ukraine, once you are working in telehealth solution, then your patients would most probably go to you uh, to receive the consultation because they trust you, they know who you are, so uh, they are not new to the system and to the process. So telehealth solution should not uh, meet only one standard requirement, but uh, there are also some specific, um, specific requirements, specific aspects that needed to be in place in terms of when we speak about the disaster implementation. So uh, it, it would depend on the disaster, of course, what kind of specific requirements need to be met. Um, the telehealth deployment and onboarding, yes, it must be efficient. It must be quick and easy to do as it would minimize definitely the, the startup time. So you would like to start as soon as possible avoiding any unnecessary procedures. And the nature of the disaster in the country of deployment is definitely a um, huge consideration when you think of any kind of telehealth uh, solution, but also when you have to make any kind of strategic decision because that definitely matters. The context is important. Uh, everything is important in this place. 
I would probably skip this one. It's a digital health ecosystem. It was designed by uh, my colleagues uh, who are digital health specialists. So it's, uh, it's quite a uh, unique and interesting system. And of course, it's still uh, in the progress. So uh, on one hand, we have domains and technologies, of course. And on the other hand, we do have uh, various programs who are interlinked with those domains and technologies. So as you can see, we have a telehealth solution. We do work on a virtual hospital. We have the educational program. Uh, it's uh, Health Tech Without Borders Academy. We work on mental health. I would address mental health um, in some time. And of course, we have some accreditation and vetting tools. This is something which is an uh, um, ongoing process right now. So, of course, there are many challenges when you'd like to provide a telehealth. Um, how would you do that? What are the variety of digital health solutions? How can they support healthcare provision? And of course, here we're talking about the vulnerable populations, the people who are really affected in the war and are living in the work country of the war and people who had to flee, so the refugees. So uh, many challenges are there. And when you think of the telehealth, then you can uh, probably imagine that women's health might be a challenge because that's something there are some um, healthcare problems which are not easily addressed by uh, telehealth. So you really have to think in advance, how would you do that? Then of course we have first referrals. If nothing ever happened to a person and uh, now he or she would like to use telehealth because there's no other solution in this place. So it's quite difficult. People are not trained to, to use telehealth. So there is a, a huge component of uh, health literacy and, and telehealth literacy, digital literacy there. Uh, chronic diseases. In this case, people are seeing specialists for many years. So they trust one specialist, maybe two, because they have already experience with those people. And then you can imagine now you have to consult somebody who you never saw in person, who you don't know and maybe not fully trust. So um, this patient uh, clinician interaction might be in risk. And then we have emergencies. What do you do? In this case, telehealth is definitely the solution for the emergency. But uh, the question is, if the person is um, available, able to uh, to address the specific symptoms which have to do with the emergency. So here again, the health literacy and of course way of communication is, the, is very important. I already mentioned that uh, e-health literacy and language might be a problem, might be an issue in uh, conflict, in war in Ukraine. Um, there is a language specific component which definitely needs to be addressed because many people uh, speak Russian. Uh, however, after the start of the war, they didn't want to speak Russian anymore. So that's why um, it was quite challenging because on the other hand, even though they didn't want to speak Russian, uh, they only wanted to speak Ukrainian. It was quite difficult to find the amount of, of clinicians who would be able to address their uh, will, their needs. And on the other hand, those patients were not really uh, capable of speaking English. So it was really limiting for, um, for providing digital health. And of course, various uh, health systems. So here I'm talking about the health system in Ukraine, for example, as we're talking about the Ukrainian conflict. And of course, the health systems uh, from the hosting countries, because uh, when people, after the start of the war, people started fleeing the country. So they might end up in any country. So for example, in, in the UK, there is a very different health system, uh, which is uh, not compatible with the Ukrainian one. So there would be some, some clash of this um, uh, expectations from the on the patient level. So in this case, they would still like to to receive some telehealth consultation um, rather than um, go to the to the local hospital where the person won't be 
uh, seen on the pseudo whatsoever. And still, some lab tests might be performed in this particular hospital in UK, for example. And uh, the person would like to discuss them with uh, his or her clinician uh, who is providing telehealth. So how do you do that? There is some, some, um, some transfer of, of information which is not always compatible with, um, within uh, the countries. Uh, this is uh, how we support the patients. This article was written about one year ago. Uh, it's about the rapid deployment of telehealth in a complex zone. Um, in this case, uh, our colleagues, uh, the founders of Health Tech Without Borders wrote it. And it shows that, for example, and again, this, it's about a year ago, uh, the number of visits, as you can see, the general care and prevention was absolutely the highest number of visits. And then we have the infectious diseases, which was also quite uh, quite high amount. Um, so the war started in February, and uh, February in Ukraine is it's quite cold. Oh, I would say it's it's, it's very cold in this case. So it, it would stay cold until I don't know end of March probably. So the infectious diseases was again a huge problem. Then of course pediatrics, yeah, it's uh, it's it's very challenging because people rather do not use the telehealth for pediatrics because it's it's of course they would like to their child to be seen by the specialist. Then we have dermatological consultations, neurological or psychological consultations. As you can see, also some issues with pregnancy related ears, no throats, uh, dental, gynecology, uh, well, any kind of uh, diagnostic groups were there. You can see the absolute uh, number in terms of percentages is also there, but still, so the general care and prevention was absolutely, well, almost a half of the old referrals. So uh, it was based on both physical and mental health support of Ukrainians since the beginning of the war. And um, in our case, we started working with a doctor online. That's the name of the telehealth mm -hmm. solution we're still using. And uh, there are many consultations that have been provided. I would like to invite you to, um, to read this uh, report. Uh, it was published, well, exactly one year ago, February 15, 2023, in the new journal, a New England Journal of Medicine. So this is the doctor online interface. On the uh, right side, you can see um, the 50th day of the war. And at that time, uh, well, more than 14 and a half thousand consultations had been performed. And then, for example, they had the, the statistics per day. So today, well, 50th day of the war, they have uh, performed those kind of, as you can see, 200 63 consultations for males, uh, 470 for females, and for the children, also quite huge amounts. And on the left side, you can see the 40, 463rd day of the war, and you can see the amount is, of course, changed a lot. And you also can see, on the other hand, that the amount of consultations dropped also because uh, well, it's been a while already people really find their way you know how to navigate through the healthcare systems all over the world so and still there are a lot of consultations ongoing so uh, there is intuitive interface provided by doctor online so for example the first step is that how you enter the consultation then some laboratory research must be um, carried out so you probably would receive some suggestion what kind of lab test you must do. And then after that, you do the repeated consultation and then receive the drugs. So the prescription of the drugs was obviously an issue because if you are not the practicing doctor in Ukraine, then you cannot prescribe drugs. So, uh, and if the person is of course uh, in Ukraine in this case. So for example, if a person is somewhere abroad, uh, having consultation from the, from the doctor from the physician in Ukraine and the doctor still would like to prescribe drugs it's possible but then in this case who would collect them and the other way other hand of course if the Ukrainian uh, person uh, living in Ukraine 
receiving the consultation from someone from abroad. For example, it still might be Ukrainian uh, or person with Ukrainian origin, but living in US, for example, well, this person did not have any prescription rights. So that might be, uh, there should be a way to, to deal with that. So it's, it's still, it's still like that. It's still quite challenging. So, um, but there are ways how to deal with that. So as you can see the intuitive interface, the steps are quite similar to the normal procedure. So uh, regardless whether it's digital or telehealth or the, the normal standard care, the steps are quite comparable, but these are just on your phone. So uh, this is something else. This is technical medical chatbot that we have been, uh, that we created, that we have been working uh, on. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great tool because it's uh, easy to use chatbots. It does not have that much of the visual, visuals or audios. So it's quite uh, easy and friendly interface uh, providing really essential uh, steps for civilians and for the professionals. So as you can see, uh, there are four uh, components within the tactical medical chatbot. First one is for the civilian, how do I stop bleeding? So when you enter it, so there is a visible bleeding, what to do? And there are easy steps to follow. And then there are three other um, aspects, so components, care under fire, tactical field care, and tactical evacuation care. So those are quite difficult to be performed by the civilians, but still, of course, possible. We have uh, created these chatbots uh, mainly for the uh, training uh, purposes mm, because uh, some students, some paramedics, some combat medics still can refresh their knowledge on uh, how to deal with either bleeding or uh, they have to perform care on the fire. So, of course, we can imagine that on the front line, it's quite difficult to, to have the phone and then just constantly consulting what are the steps. So um, it's quite useful to use it before that. So for example, if you have any time just to go through the steps to understand um, what to do in case something would happen, in case you would have to perform care under fire. And of course, uh, in this case, um, we definitely bear it in mind that uh, in case of the danger, uh, you would not perform any care. So in this case, you really have to seek for um, of a safer place. So uh, this medical, uh, tactical medical chatbot is unfortunately available only in Ukraine with Ukrainian IP address. That was the requirement from the manufacturers because we have been working together with the Microsoft disaster response team on that. So there were some restrictions to that and there were only two languages. Still, there are two languages as far as I know. Uh, we're working on a third language, but uh, as for now, it's uh, Ukrainian and uh, English language. And then, as I already mentioned, we have uh, a very important component in every um, disaster, in any humanitarian crisis, it's the mental health. So the mental health support is crucial uh, anytime, anywhere, for any person and of course also for the clinicians who are performing healthcare. So uh, we have created, we have been working on mental health support for the clinicians and we call that Helping Healer Heal or 3H program. It's a really nice peer-to-peer -peer support and kind of coaching program. It's not supervision, it's really the peer support of them. In, in our case, we started with the mental health uh, professionals. So, when the war has started, um, there was a lot of traumatizing experiences. You can only imagine how many. And of course, um, the assaults, uh, horrifying things happened to people. And those people were obviously um, consulting psychologists. Well, psychology is quite popular discipline in Ukraine. It was before as well. But uh, no one ever dealt with this kind of trauma before, because the war trauma is not comparable to domestic violence. And yet there were, of course, the uh, cases of domestic violence, so there were any kind of violence. So our clinicians who are providing mental health support directly to the population, they were destroyed too, 
because uh, through their ears, uh, well, they have received, I don't know how much harmful information, damaging information. So they had to process it too, because they are people too, obviously. So uh, we were inspired by, um, by some other works performed by the US colleagues, and we wanted to create something like that. So uh, at the first stage, we had the pilot, and uh, uh, we had the pilot with only 12 Ukrainian mental health specialists. So bear in mind that those uh, people, they were really clinicians those 12 people. And uh, those clinicians had, of course, the network of patients. And in this case, by helping 12 Ukrainian mental health specialists, we were able to reach out to more than uh, 75 patients. So it was an indirect support for the patients as well. And then in the end, uh, so let's just say that's quite recent data, uh, end of January, there is always, uh, there's almost um, one and a half thousand hours of mental health support conducted for 24 participants and led by uh, four facilitators. The impact is, of course, much higher now. It's uh, over 6,000 uh, patients and clients. So it's, uh, it's a huge um, support. And uh, this mental health support or health the healer heal support was not conducted only for Ukrainian uh, healthcare specialists or clinicians. It was also uh, conducted for the Turkish mental health and clinicians uh, during the earthquake some time ago. The other thing uh, is our future workforce. So how to deal with the shortage of the workforce and how to deal with the future workforce who is afraid to work in the, in the healthcare, especially in the, um, in the war zone. So um, we have been uh, again thinking how to support the young healthcare professionals mentally and motivationally. Um, and so, so they would be able to continue with their studying they would be still motivated to support their country. And um, we come up with, um, with other solutions. We have uh, created some group discussions with the young healthcare professionals. In this case, those are Ukrainian uh, young nurses. And um, we really supported them by just talking to them, just providing them the information on sleeping hygiene, providing the information on how to prevent the burnouts, we wanted to know what are their fears, expectations, what are their beliefs, uh, what do they think, uh, what's going to be next, uh, where they, do they want to work, any kind of thing. So we, we were actually there for them. And also, it's not uh, mentioned here, but uh, those students sitting in the, in, the, in the container, and this container was provided by um, uh, our partner organization. Uh, it was fully equipped. So it was uh, absolutely great that uh, our colleagues were able to, to support our young uh, professionals so they were able to study. Um, as this uh, container was fully equipped, as you can see, there are tables and chairs. There was also a generator in terms, uh, well, in case there is no power, there is no electricity. So it's, uh, it's still there, they're still working. Um, Refugees' mental health and needs uh, and supports. Well, as we're now in the, well, the second uh, two years of war are already passed. So we're entering the third year of the war and nobody knows uh, how long it will take. Lots of people uh, flee the country and they never can, came back. So uh, we're also dealing with that. Uh, of course, there's also a huge shortage of uh, healthcare professionals because in Ukraine, a lot of healthcare professionals and mental healthcare professionals are females. So, uh, and of course, the females with children are allowed to leave the country because males are not. Um, so, lots of people really uh, not there, not there also for for um, to support healthcare system, and still it's their choice, of course, to be uh, safe in other country. So um, we have another great initiative and it has been, uh, it went online yesterday. So we have been working uh, together with MindStep and Sora Union on uh, one great uh, app 
Mind Step for Ukraine, it calls. So it's a, it's a platform. It's it's an app, obviously, but it does provide some personalized and uh, validated mental health uh, support so with guidance. And uh, this app uh, is uh, is of course uh, to be downloaded only in the App Store right now. It would be also available on the on the Android uh, devices, but for now only on the on the uh, iOS devices. Uh, and here we have been working together with other colleagues um, to make it contextually appropriate. So we haven't been working only on the on the language. We have conducted huge amount of work how to make this application really suitable to this particular context. It has to be culturally sensitive because the initially mind step is the UK app. So it is really based on the uh, population from UK. And you could really see that because we went through this app and we know how it looks like. So in this case, this mind step for Ukraine was really um, contextualized. And we're really proud of our work because it really provides the information which is suitable, which is tailored to the population, especially to the refugee population. Right now, the mind step for Ukraine is available for Ukrainian refugees or displaced people based in UK. And this is um, uh, because of the credentialing system and of course, because of the law. So these kind of things always have to be bear it in mind. So you cannot just um, create something and it would go live anywhere. No, of course, you have to comply um, with the local regulations uh, and healthcare systems. Also, uh, it's going to be quite soon. Uh, I would be participating online in this case, but we have been invited on uh, to be at the, uh, one of the partners at the panel discussion, but would like to address some kind of new opportunities and uh, uh, how to make the patient outreach um, suitable, uh, what kind of global humanitarian missions are out there, what kind of uh, effective telehealth applications um, must be deployed, how to deal with healthcare, uh, with health literacy, how to deal with uh, any other new uh, technologies, what to do with AI, how to engage uh, other professionals and how where to find those volunteers who are also are quite uh, tired probably to to be a volunteer so many other efforts would be discussed at that time and uh, well i would be also presenting online unfortunately because it's in uh, austin texas and i'm here in india so it's quite difficult for me to travel so, um, and I also already mentioned that we have academy because any uh, digital health, uh, any telehealth solution, uh, regardless what kind of solution it is, we always have to bear in mind there are always some um, new opportunities. There is new information and nothing is uh, static, uh, the world is dynamic, the information is dynamic, we have to really understand what's out there, what kind of new information and what kind of innovations must be employed. So in this uh, case, for our Health Tech Without Borders Academies, we have several lectures and still ongoing lectures that have been recorded with uh, professionals from Massachusetts General Hospital, from Microsoft team, from the VC organization, from Yeshiva University, Stanford, Harvard, Boston, Cuts Medical School, and the Butterfly Network. That's also a great organization um, who really make the amazing devices which are used uh, in the conflict zones. This is the page where we have provided information on uh, any kind of news that we have, for example, um, uh, we are working also together with uh, uh, with Clean Cell Global Initiative. Uh, we have been working together with uh, Vital Africa. Uh, it's uh, it's it's actually amazing how many things are possible. The only thing that you must uh, have is the time and uh, and the motivation for to participate and to help. Uh, we also have been highlighted by the Week magazine of India. And um, it was some time ago, September 
um, and uh, our stories was also published uh, there. So that's uh, the perspective of me and my colleague was also addressed there. How do we think we should deal with um, with any kind of trauma? So I specifically focused on the mental health. My colleague focused on uh, on clinical care. So in this case, uh, we were really grateful to to be able to to give an interview for the the Times. Well, this is uh, this is it. I think I'm right on time. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, for your presence today. And in case if I won't be able to answer some of your questions, I'm more than happy to uh, to reply to them in any other way. That's uh, me again in uh, in the town where my parents live. So some things are still like that. Some infrastructure is way better. But just uh, to mention that um, the conflict is ongoing. Uh, today is at one country. Uh, tomorrow it might be a different country. And we always must be ready and prepared to act. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you 